Hello, 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 and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is Huddy, and when I'm not telling my own vampire stories, I'm talking about this vampire story, New York by Night. Season 3 is coming soon, so I thought it would be a good time to make a recap of the story so far. If you want even more in-depth analysis on every episode, I will link my playlist somewhere on the video right now. Also, if you're looking for a full character breakdown of each of the main Coterie members, those videos will come out sometime after the airing of Season 3. Now with that out of the way, let's get into it, shall we? The story of New York by Night focuses on the two major factions struggling for power and control in the city that never sleeps, namely the Anarchs and the Camarilla, with Season 1 telling an Anarch story and Season 2 telling a Camarilla story, with both of them having important connections and overlapping eventually in their timelines. Of course, the city itself has its own part to play, specifically laying out the political framework of the undead in the modern night, based on what has happened in nights gone by. By the way, if you want some New York City in the World of Darkness lore, I recommend these sources on screen and or, as I said, watching my episodic recaps. Season 1 introduces us to a group of recently embraced Anarchs, the Ventru Margot Fuego Walker, the Samitsi Isaac Brooks, the gangrel Reyes Ray Malcolm, and the Ravnos Seraph. After all of them made certain vampire faux pas in the domain of an influential anarch named Richter, these baby anarchs formed up as a coterie, Richter tasking them with a job, both as a repayment for their indiscretions in his domain and with a promise of turf of their own, should they prove competent, of course. Richter tells the coterie about a kindred named Drexler, who was supposed to show up to pay his rent, but never did, never even called to say he was going to be late, so he wants to know what's keeping him and for the coterie to give him a manila folder that he is to read and consent to. The Coterie all agree to Richter's request, but really, what other choice did they have? Once the Coterie arrive at Drexler's cab company, it quickly becomes apparent that he was held up against his will. With the cooperation of Isaac's two ghouls, Angela and Michael, the Coterie are able to chase away Drexler's kidnappers, who happen to be a group of Hikata, specifically Putinescas. We learn that inside the manila folder is a note informing Drexler that he needs to uh, take off his hand and bring it back to Richter as uh, a punishment for not showing up, which he does agree to. Returning victorious, this newly formed coterie received their own piece of domain within the Bronx, convenient for Isaac, who already has a haven in the area, and the coterie get themselves acquainted with their new boss's coterie. There's Consuela, his right hand that is prone to being jealous of anyone Richter pays attention to, Airbox, his gangrel enforcer, and Lizzie, his Malkavian oracle. Of course, it's not all tea parties and ice cream socials, as Richter informs them that the Hikata are on their turf, and now they are their problem, and it is their job to take care of it, and to not let it become a problem that he has to handle. So as the Coterie set out on a tour of their new neighborhood, they happen upon a watch group or a neighborhood watch group who claim to be out in force because they've heard talk of something monstrous wandering the streets. With no idea of what they could possibly be getting into, they head out into the night, searching the locations told to them by the group. Eventually, they run into a creature, at one time a vampire, but now mindless, no traces of humanity, completely consumed by its beast, what kindred call a white. Attacking as a unit, the Coterie are able to inflict some damage on the creature but it quickly becomes apparent that it is not easily defeated. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a car slams into both the White and Ray, causing Ray damage and forcing the White to flee by leaping up above a nearby bridge into oncoming traffic. The Coterie take note that this mysterious car is a vintage hearse and it's being driven by Cat Costello, a Hikata they met their first night at Richter's. Cat chastises them for attempting to go after something like a White, and she also goes on to voice her concern that the White is the result of a renewed Sabbat presence in the city. Cat eventually gets down to business, asking the Coterie if they know of Marco Putinesca. Coterie claim to know of the Putinescas and admit to kicking the asses of some at Drexler's place a couple nights earlier. Kat tells them that the Putinesca are trouble, and she offers to keep them off the Coterie's back in exchange for a favor. She tells them about the HMS Hussar, a ship that ran aground and sank off the coast of New York in 1780, and about its captain, a man she calls Charlie. Kat claims to want to speak to his ghost, but his remains are underneath a development called the Crescent, and asks the Coterie to bring back his skull, to which they agree. The next night, the Coterie make their way toward the Crescent, and as they travel through what will someday be an underground car park, I assume, the Coterie suddenly come face to face with armed mortals. And although social subterfuge is utilized, it doesn't go as planned. And an attack breaks out, leaving one guard dead at Fuego's hands and another severely, possibly mortally injured, who is saved only by Ray giving him some of his blood. The outing was not a total wash, however, as they did learn that any skeletal remains that have been found during the construction have been removed to a local 
local warehouse. This alerts the Coterie to the likelihood that this development has at the very least a nefarious person behind it, and at the most likely, a Camarilla Kindred. As the Coterie break apart for a bit, some for self-reflection, some for personal reasons, Isaac remains on task and makes his way into the warehouse. Eventually, he learns that it is a kindred named Nigel running this warehouse who works for a Camarilla venture named Rafferty, which happens to be the name of Fuego's sire. Successfully intimidating Nigel, Isaac makes his egress, bones in tow. As the Coterie regroup and take a trip to visit Isaac's sire, who gives them the skinny on the sabbat that Kat mentioned, they are more determined than ever to rid their domain of the white. Taking the creature on once again, this time more tactical and prepared, they successfully defeat it. However, Ray attempts to stop Isaac from sending it to the final death. When questioned why, Ray reveals that he was part of the Camarilla from his embrace, that he owes things to them due to some unnamed incident that put him on the outs with the Ivory Tower, and that he simply wants his old life back. And more than that, he wants the respect and power that the Camarilla society can give him, something that he believes the Anarchs cannot. And to gain these things, he needs proof of the White's existence to prove himself valuable. The Anarch Coterie are left stunned with a seeming traitor in their ranks. Meanwhile, in Season 2, we are introduced to a fledgling Camarilla Coterie consisting of Kalita the Ventru, Coco the La Sombra, Braun the Nosferatu, and Kiem the Toreador. They are all at a five-star hotel called the Sterling, owned by Kalita's sire, a man named Rafferty. Yes, that same Rafferty who sired Fuego. All of them were told to be there by their sires, save for Kiem, as her sire has recently disappeared. Rafferty informs the group that an art gallery in his domain is hosting some unusual art that supposedly is affecting mortals. He tells the group to investigate, and should this be a breach of the masquerade, for them to take care of it. Should they accomplish this, Rafferty will owe them all a piece of his domain. Inside the art gallery, the Camarilla Coterie discover that it is Richter's coterie mate Lizzie who is responsible for this enchanted artwork. A fight breaks out as Kiem and Braun attempt to restrain Lizzie and bring her with them. With the aid of a little violence and a fire alarm, the Coterie are successful in their mission. However, Rafferty only awards them a fraction of the domain he was going to offer them, as the extraction of Lizzie was not handled with any sort of finesse. Tasked now with returning Lizzie to the Anarch domain of the Bronx, the Camarilla get a glimpse of how the other side lives, and some of them are more than a little impressed. However, Kalita quickly learns of Fuego's existence, as Fuego has spent more than a few nights at the cage and people are aware of her. Before the cam leaves, Braun goes mano y mano with Airbox in the cage's fighting ring and comes out victorious, likely leaving a sour taste in many of the Anarch's mouths. But of course, work for Rafferty seems never ending, and he swiftly sends the Coterie to check on the workers of his warehouse, because apparently, a very intimidating kindred broke in and stole something. Of course, referencing what happened with Isaac in season and one, and alerting the Coterie that Rafferty is the developer behind the Crescent in the Bronx, a territory technically outside of the Camarilla. As the Coterie rolls up to armed and paranoid mortals, they neutralize them handily, and eventually track down Nigel, the kindred who was in charge of the warehouse. Coterie learn that Nigel's memories of the events have been erased, so they decide to take him back to Rafferty. On their way out, however, the Coterie are stopped by Prince Panhard and her sheriff, Kadir al-Azmai. The two of them demand to know what their sires have been doing in the city, clearly aware that there is some sort of conspiracy afoot. The Coterie, almost without hesitation, inform them of how they came together as a Coterie, that all their sires are in a Coterie together, Rafferty's business ventures in the Anarch territory, and Kiem's missing and likely destroyed sire. And of course, Rafferty's ambition to unseat the current Ventru Primogen and claim the title for himself. Panhard agrees to let them go after taking in all of this information, and warns them what will happen to them should they go running to their sires to tell them about this meeting. They decide to pretend that everything is fine, and continue on the mission to take Nigel back to Rafferty, in the hopes that perhaps Rafferty can probe Nigel's mind for the missing information about the warehouse. However, when the Coterie arrive at the Sterling, the hotel is in lockdown mode, and all of their sires, save for Kiem's of course, are waiting for them in the penthouse. Kiem, who can no longer wait for answers, demands to know why her sire is not present and where he is. And surprisingly, Rafferty admits to getting rid of him. So, Kiem goes to attack Rafferty. However, this act breaks the Coterie apart entirely, as everyone takes the sides of their own sires. Kalita compels Braun to protect Rafferty and herself, forcing his sire Glassjaw to take the side of the Ventru. Coco and her sire Renato attack Rafferty and Kalita, forcing them out of the hotel with Braun and Glassjaw in tow. Meanwhile, Kiem makes a break for it, takes off on her own to meet up with her ghoul, someone who was sent to her by her mortal father. 
The Camarilla Coterie are left broken, betrayed, and scattered, much more so than the Anarch Coterie, who I would argue were just left betrayed. And it is unknown if the Camarilla Coterie can ever come together again, even against a greater foe lurking in the background of both Season 1 and Season 2, which is, of course, the Sword of Cain themselves, the Sabbat. If you enjoyed this video, consider giving it a like or subscribing to me, and I'll see you for Season 3 of New York by Night, where I will be recapping every single episode. Until then, bye-bye.